Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about in the meeting um, on Thursday was that we still had to deal with some of the questions from the congregation about the possibility of establishing an eldership. And uh, that's true. So I have um, questions that are gathered. And as the slide says, uh, these are questions from the people who assemble here, <laughs> not just, you know, questions that you can find out there in the world or in Brotherhood papers or whatever. Uh, these are the questions that you have from the members of the of the church here. Um, and at the moment, I've uh, I actually only have three that uh, are to be addressed. So and, and those those three. Uh, are are these so the first one is uh, whether a man with only one child is qualified to serve as an elder the, the next one is whether all of the children that a man has um, must all of them be Christians in order for him to serve as an elder um, and uh, the third one is I guess two for one which is do you have to have deacons? And if so, do you have to have a plurality of deacons? Um, if you have other questions that are not one of these three, tell me so that we can add them to the list and address them. Um, but the point of it is that we'll get through all of these questions with answers from the Bible, and uh, then we will open a period for people to give nominations if there are any and in the at the end of that period of time which is probably going to be the end of the month we'll see if we have any nominations and consider those so that's the plan um, and I don't know how many elders Q&A lessons there are going to be I think there's at least two out of the questions that we have so far and if there are others, let me know, and we'll address them, whatever it takes uh, for us to make sure that we have covered this uh, and answered everybody's uh, concerns and, and, and questions, you know, whatever you got, so that we can accomplish the will of God in this place. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, right, the first question, can a man with only one child serve as an elder? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about clearing my throat. I'll try to step away when I do that. It's been a while with this illness. Um, okay, so, and the question, I think, stems from 1 Timothy 3, 4, where the requirements... Uh, as stated, say, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Um, and it does indeed use the word children here. There's, uh, it's unambiguously a plural in this case. There's, he's, it's saying that he, a father, must manage his own household and keep the children submissive. I, from this wording, I think, uh, sometimes people draw the conclusion that the plurality of children is the requirement here. Um, but I think that the question about whether that's it, you know, because the other way of looking at that is that, well, the meaning is that he managed his household well, and the evidence of that is that his children are submissive and that it's a dignified house. Um, without reference, really, to how many of the children, how many children he has. Uh, especially when you consider that household in the original language includes everybody who lives under that roof, which might be, uh, ex you know, which might be grandparents, it might be servants, um, things like that. <clears throat> so everybody is to be submissive. He's supposed to be in charge, is the idea. He's the ruler, the manager of this house. All right, but I think that the question of, you know, how many children... Um, that he is supposed to have, that he is required to have, 
is a matter that can be settled by looking at the rest of the letter. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul put the qualifications for men to serve as elders in, uh, you know, in chapter 3, but there is another set of qualifications in chapter 5 for a woman who is a widow to be enrolled. And when you look at those, and they're both, uh, you know, qualifiers, they're both identifying people um, who can be selected and people who cannot be selected, right? And they both refer to children. So that can be a useful way of finding the answer to this question. So in the fifth chapter, in the ninth verse, beginning, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband. And it goes on from there with many different qualities that she must display if she's going to be enrolled. What does it mean to be enrolled? Enrollment is a reference to Acts chapter 6, where uh, the church provides for the widows, provides for their care, their daily feeding. So it is done uh, by the church. It is done at church expense. The, a widow who is truly in need, a widow who does not have income and does not have somebody to care for her who is a Christian and has met the qualities outlined in 1 Timothy 5, 9 and following is the responsibility of the church. The church cares for her, provides for her. That's what it means to be enrolled. But they don't enroll every widow. A 59-year-old widow does not qualify. She cannot be less than 60 years of age. Uh, a widow who was in, you know, a polygamous relationship, or I guess a polyandrous uh, relationship, does not qualify, etc. Just the same way that we looked at the qualities of the elders, these are basically... Um, aspects of a faithful life. A faithful Christian lives this way. Right. <clears throat> but to the question of, uh, of uh, children, again, this passage here in 1 Timothy 5, just uh, about the widows, is just like the passage in chapter 3 about elders, because it's a list of qualifications. Um, you know, for chapter 3, the person who is being considered, the candidate, has to meet all of those qualities in order to be appointed as an elder. In this chapter, 5, the candidate, the widow, must meet all the qualifications here in order to become an enrolled widow, somebody cared for at church expense. That's perfectly valid and good, and it's right that the church do that. But there are, there are rules for who can do this, who is allowed to be cared for in this way. And in this passage, the same way that in the other passage, uh, it, that is to say in chapter 5 as well as in chapter 3, with the, with the widows and with the elders, you have the mention of children, literally children. So I think that when you look at the widow's children in chapter 5, you get the answer that you need to apply it to chapter 3. And I'll show you how that works. This is how I came to this conclusion. Um, you know, 1 Timothy 5, 3 to 4 sets it up in this way. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. Okay, so there's a distinction between truly widow <laughs> and widow. Widow indeed, if you will. Truly widow meaning somebody who really is all alone, who really does not have any support available to her. That's different from, well, my husband has passed, but he left me a large fortune, or my husband has passed, but our eight sons um, will care for me. You know, that's a very different situation from I was dependent on my husband, he has passed, I have no source of income. 
my children have passed or are poor or whatever um, refuse to do this whatever it might be these are truly widows and these widows uh, are to be cared for the widow that has children or grandchildren should have the children or grandchildren care for her that's the thing that it says if she has children or grandchildren let them first learn to show godliness in their own household so a widow though she be 60 years old and the wife of one uh, one husband etc etc can still not enroll if she has living children or grandchildren that's what it says the living children or grandchildren are charged with her care not the church even if she meets the other qualities if she has children or grandchildren well they are supposed to care for her that's how it works and then in the ninth and tenth verses let her be enrolled if she has brought up children so uh, she has to uh, you know she has to be a mother as well um, if she if she is widowed but is not did not bring up children she you know that's not somebody that qualifies for you know ongoing care at church expense for the rest of her life right? the church can still do charitable work for individual members of the congregation on an ad hoc as needed basis you know within reason but when it comes to a widow indeed who meets these qualities she has brought up children and she's all these things we're obligated to care for her <laughs> that's a different matter so the second mention of children you know the first one was the children should care for her the second one is she she needs to have been a mother to begin with if she's going to become enrolled at church expense she cannot be enrolled if she did not bring up children so these things are telling us that she's required to have children too and the children are required to care for her so we know with certainty at this point that a single child meets the qualification and I'll tell you why <laughs> between these two verses here you know that one child meets it and there's there's a very clear reason for that if we take that word children that occurs in first Timothy 5 in these two places if we take that word to mean absolutely it has to be a plurality of children it's not just regular speak for being a mom or having descendants but is a very precise thing that means she must have a multiple number more than one child if that's the way that you take it you have a problem if we do it that way the verses contradict themselves that's what happens notice if a widow has one child she is not allowed to enroll because it says she has to have children that would be the contention if an elder who has only one child can't serve because it says children then a widow who has only one child cannot enroll because it says children it has to be so so if she has had a child and has been widowed does she qualify or not right that would be the question and you say well that's the same as the question in chapter 3 it is although I think it's a little bit more obvious that you would not withhold charitable assistance from somebody in need in this situation who has in fact been a mother that's the point but it's even clearer at verse 4 where if you make the word children require a plurality then her only child is not children and therefore her only child is not required to care for her because it says children in verse 4 if she has children let them care for her but if she has a child well he's off the hook you think so no that's clearly not right right that's how I got to this conclusion is that can't be true who can believe that a plurality of children are required to care for mom but an only child no he has no responsibility for that and on top of that he doesn't have to care for her and she's not allowed to be cared for by the church either because she only had one you really think that's the situation God intends 
That doesn't, that's not what it means. Right? We're taking that term too literally, if you will, if we think that it requires a plurality. What it really is getting at is that she was a faithful mother, and her children, if they are going to be faithful, would care for her. Whether that's one or many of them is not relevant, that's not the point. The intent is that she has been a faithful wife, she has been a faithful mother, she has, you know, discharged her Christian duty in life, in the roles that she has played. That's the point. And the same, therefore, must be true in 1 Timothy 3, that the elder is also to have been a faithful husband and a faithful father who has discharged his duties in the roles that he has in life. That's the meaning of this. It's not really about uh, the precise number here or the plurality of them. It's about his quality as a father or her quality as a mother in the case of the widow. Um, it has to be so. If, if we're going to take children, because it says children, well, yes, it does, and that's a plural. Yes, it is. If that means that a single child disqualifies the elder, then that also means that a single child disqualifies the widow from care, and a single child is also not required to care for her, because it says children are required to care for her, not a child. And that really doesn't follow. That doesn't make sense. That's clearly not what is intended. And that tells me that if I'm reading it like that, that it requires them to be more than one, I'm reading it wrong. Because that's clearly not the intent with the widow. So I'll let, I'll let the scripture interpret itself like this. Right? That's how that one goes. So it has to be the case that we're focused on the fact that this person is a parent without regard to how many children they have, it is. This is a father, this is a mother. They have to be like this in order to qualify. Um, so next question, which is, can a man serve if only some of his children believe? Not all of his children. He does not have 100% belief uh, rate among his uh, children. And I'm gonna assume in this that we are talking about children who, who could believe. Okay, uh, you know, if somebody asks children of very disparate ages, you may have some who are too young to believe, and that's, I don't think, I don't think anybody's talking about that. Maybe they are, but I don't think so. I'm going to assume that what we mean is, he has some children who have obeyed the gospel, and he has some children who have not obeyed the gospel. Some number, some mixture thereof. And that is a valid question. <clears throat> so we go back to 1 Timothy 3, uh, which says in 4 and 5, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Well, you know, this one, this passage, 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5, separate from Titus 1, just this one all on its own, does not specifically address whether the children believe in God or not. This one is just talking about whether they are submissive at home, whether he is in charge, whether he knows how to manage his house. That doesn't mean his children don't have to believe. I'm just saying 1 Timothy doesn't really comment on it. So we move from there to Titus 1, which at verse 6 gives among the qualities, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And it does say here, his children are believers. Um, maybe you would say, well, children here in the plural could be like children in the plural 1 Timothy 3, where he has a child who is believing. Yeah, it could be. I think that's reasonable. But we should look also at this phrase in multiple different translations. The ESV says this in a way that makes it sound like it is required that all of the children be believers. And I think the NIV does it that way too. But this same Greek phrase, which is literally children having faithful 
Not that he holds them faithful or forces faith upon them, which is not even possible, but that he has children who are faithful. And that's what most of the translations that we trust say. I do trust the ESV uh, as a rule, the English Standard Version. But the King James had said having faithful children, and the New King James did not change it. Uh, there's this thing called Young's Literal Translation, which is a very old one that uh, is an interesting way of looking at things, but he also says having children steadfast um, because he's trying to mimic the, the Greek grammar there, children having faithful um, Steadfast, I think, is a mistake on his part, but that's fine. Um, American Standard said having children that believe, which is very similar to having faithful children, I would say. New American Standard went with the same verbiage, having children who believe. Christian Standard said with faithful children, which is similar to having faithful children, with faithful children, eh, pretty much the same. But my point in showing this is that um, most of the translations do not imply that he has 100% believing children. Most of the translations leave it as he has children who have faith, which would allow for a mixture. Some children have faith, some do not. That is a possibility from the grammar, certainly. And I wanted to show that it's a possibility in most translations. Um, so first of all, I wanted to put that out there. You're not, I don't want you to take my word for it, I guess, is what I should say about that. But you can see from the way that it's being rendered that most of the translations believe that a proper rendering of this allows for a mixture. Um, I think, too, that you can use the widow's qualifications in this case like we did in the case before. How many believing children? We knew how many children, or we know how many children as a result of what was recorded there. We can also figure out how many believing children. It is between the lines, but it is there. So we read at 1 Timothy 5, 4, that the children of a widow are required to take charge of her care. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. The first thing that is to happen for any widow, even though she otherwise is qualified to serve or to be enrolled, the first thing is that her children should should uh, shoulder this burden and care for her. That's the requirement. But it's clear, um, you know, in experience, but it's also clear in the text that not all children fear God. And that's just the truth of the matter. Not all children fear God. What it tells you later in 1 Timothy 5, the rest of that context you know, at the 16th verse, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. So where the that fourth verse had said, if she has children or grandchildren, let them care for her. By the time you get to verse 16, you know, and you've gone through this qualities and you thought, of, you know, you have more specs to work with, I guess. He very precisely says, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. So the, the widow, this, not, this focus is not on the widow as a believing woman, but the believer has a relative who is a widow. It's incumbent upon that person to care for them. So what we're, what we're getting at is, when it says her children were to care for her, it's clear in the 16th verse that that would be her believing children. Children who believe. Because the church, you know, we can't rely on children who do not believe 
to conform to the doctrine of God. They may support their mother and they may not. And, you know, what say do we have in the matter? I mean, we can teach about it, of course, and we want them to be saved, we want them to come to know God and to take on this responsibility among all the other things that are enjoined upon Christians. But if they do not believe, if they do not listen to the word of God, we don't have a say over what they do, whether they care for her or not. So if we compare this, you know, verse 4 and verse 16, Right? A widow has children or grandchildren. They care for her at verse 4 and 16. If a believing woman has relatives who are widows, well, she cares for them. Those are kind of the inverse of each other. If one child believes, then, then she has children, and she has children who are required to care for her. There may be children who are not faithful to God, who are not supporting their mother. If there are members of the congregation who have a widowed mother and will not care for her, then it is the congregation's duty to rebuke that and to set that straight. And if the person will not do it, then we enter into discipline and withdraw from them because that is not the doctrine of God. That is not the walk of God. That's not how the church is supposed to conduct itself. And then, you know, she would be a widow who did bring up children, but her children don't care for her, so she would be a widow in need, and she would be qualified, assuming she meets all the others, and we could enroll her and care for her. So, you know, it seems that one believing child, strictly speaking, meets the requirement of the text. In a, in a very strict reading of this, if one believing woman has widows, she cares for them. Um, so also one believing child seems to be consistent with he has children who believe. That has to be the strict requirement. So I can't say that we are going to disqualify somebody because he has some number of children who have not obeyed the gospel. Um, when he does have some number of children who have obeyed the gospel. The next thing is a matter of judgment, right? Then people will say, well, now, shouldn't he have a majority of believing children? And I'm saying this is a matter of judgment. Um, you should look at that. And, it, you know, there's going to be a balance, if you will, that's worth thinking about. Now, if somebody's got, you know, if we're, we're like, a hundred years ago and somebody's got 13 children and only one has obeyed the gospel, you might think about that a little bit more. Like, does this guy really, should we do this? You know, that one might have done, might have just obeyed the gospel like anybody else in the world and all the other ones, you know, reflect the teaching of their father. Maybe you would make that judgment and maybe not. You got to know the guy. You got to know what does he teach? How does he treat his children? What are his children like? It may reflect on him. It may not, right? Uh, other people have said he's got 13 and 12 of them obey the gospel. One of them doesn't. Well, that seems fairly obvious. Some people will say, no, it says children. All of his children must obey. But that's just not consistent with the widow. Um, there's going to have to be some judgment there, and that's going to have to be okay. I think we um, don't have to solve all of the church's problems and all of the church's situations. We have to look at our own situation. <laughs> Uh, look at the men that you know, and what is their life? What is their teaching? How have they done with their kids? Have they, you know, uh, made sure that their, their children are are uh, taught, et cetera, et cetera? You're going to have to look at those things, and that's going to be a, an individual matter of judgment. But, you know, strictly speaking from the scriptures, a, a, a man who has a believing child is, is going to meet the, that particular quality. There's a whole lot of other qualities. I wouldn't be too concerned about this one opening a floodgate of a bunch of unqualified dudes. Um, there's a whole lot more to being an elder than just checking a handful of boxes. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that. 
I am concerned about doing what God wants us to do. On um, the one hand, I don't want um, us to overlook the requirement of God or to treat it as less than important um, and you know, somehow qualify somebody whom God does not consider qualified. But on the other hand, I also don't want us to come up um, or to, to exclude people whom God would not exclude which would do violence to the larger picture of the Lord intends for the churches to have elders. That's the organization of the New Testament and always has been. That's the norm. That's what's provided for in Scripture. Uh, and, you know, going for uh, years and years without anybody qualifying is not really scriptural. That, that can't be right. Uh, if there's something in our life that is amiss, it needs to be repaired that needs to be addressed. Um, so there's, in this way, I will admit that there is some judgment in that matter that has to be okay. Let's see. I'm really torn about whether to try to get the last question in. <laughs> I think it's kind of a longer lesson. Um, so I think I'm going to skip that. We'll come back to the last question in the next in the next lesson and make sure that we spend the time on it that it deserves. It is something of a different topic in that we're asking how many, if any, deacons are required in a local work. Um, we'll look at that, but that turned into a surprisingly large uh, study, I should say, and uh, so I think we'll hold off and look at that one this afternoon, the Lord willing. Um, for now, let us close with John three, sixteen, that God gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I think of this in connection with the discussion about um, elders and widows, because they're both kind of looking at this father's, uh, or this, you know, parent-child relationship, and the value of that, and the importance of that. And uh, so in that connection, I'd put John 3.16 in here because God certainly loves his only son, Jesus, and his only son certainly loves his father. And it was absolutely perfect in his life and the things that he did. He did not do any wrong. And yet, he was God's chosen vessel, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He became the sacrifice. As much as God loved his son, and as much as they were faithful and true to one another, father and son, he nonetheless sent his son on this mission that he would die. Completely unjustly, if you will, from a worldly perspective. He didn't do anything deserving of death. We are the ones who deserve to die, but the mercy of God was such that Jesus was made the sacrifice for us. He died on our behalf. He died instead of us so that we could be saved because God loved the world that much. That's what it's saying. When it says God so loved the world, it means he loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. The plan of God is out of his love for us, even while we were still sinners, he offered his son Jesus. He made a sacrifice available that could forgive all of our sins and bring us into a right relationship with him where we become his sons and daughters, and he becomes our father. So as important as it was to him, you know, the love of his son, and as important as God the Father was, to Jesus, he nonetheless went to a terrible death on the cross because they were serving something much larger. 
they were looking to our salvation, to the deliverance of everybody in the world. So today, if you are not a Christian, you see that God provides for us to provide for each other. <laughs> one of the things, one of the roles of, of those elders, and the reason that they have to manage their household well is they're intended to be able to help you. Even if your parents maybe don't believe or didn't believe, or maybe you didn't even have parents. You can have members of the church, perhaps it's elders, or perhaps some of the widows who have brought up children, or whatever it might be. You'll have members of the church who can serve in that role, who can help you. You can get their advice and learn from them and see how they brought up children and how they fostered faith in their children. Um, God has provided a way of escape for us from this world and from the entrapments of sin in his son Jesus and in the blessings of the church that he purchased with his blood. Uh, if today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Repent. Believe If you believe in God and if you believe in the resurrection of the dead that Jesus was the first to accomplish, then you put to death the old person of sin. You repent. You know, you decide to do God's will from now on. And then, having put that person to death, you bury them together with Jesus in baptism to be resurrected, a new person, a Christian, a child of God, from baptism. We are uh, ready to help with water for you to be baptized in the name of Jesus, is, if that is your need today in the Spirit. Today, if you are a child of God and have not been living the life of faith, you must repent of these sins and ask God for forgiveness. If it is the case that your sins have come before the congregation, you can let the congregation know in some way. You could do that coming uh, forward in the invitation. You can do that with a note or a letter of some kind. You can give it to the person who is making announcements to say something about it. There's no one way that is required, but we know that repentance of the heart is required and that letting the congregation know where you stand is required in some way. But the church is ready to help and ready to, to be a, a, a support for those that want to do what is right. That's a, it's a safe place to be clean with your God, to be honest with yourself. If we can help with our prayers for a brother or a sister, if we can help you to be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins, please let your need be known by coming to the front at this time while we stand and sing the song selected.